Hello, my name is Michael, and I want to discuss the possibility of a faster performance on computers that have lower end processors. And so I spent a lot of my professional career, you would say the better part of my adult life, in computers and information technology. And in that professional sphere, I uh, applied my skills more in the area of software development. So I, dis I make a distinction between IT and software, software and software technology, right? So I make a distinction. I see IT as more hardware focus, more networking focus. And though I have skills in that area and I've worked in that area by necessity primarily, um, my, my primary focus has been software applications, software development, databases, the optimizations of those systems. And so when I use tools in a professional environment, those tools tend to be on the higher end. And so I may have a laptop or a desktop or both, and they will have an Intel Core i7, um, 16 gigabytes of memory, uh, gigabytes of RAM minimum, one terabyte hard drive or greater. In some cases, I have multiple uh, one terabyte hard drives. And sometimes I have 64 gigabytes of memory. Uh, I may be running an Intel Xeon uh, processor. Uh, and you'll say, why do you need 64 gigabytes of memory? Well, 64 gigabytes of memory is very useful when you're running multiple operating systems at the same time on a computer by way of virtual machines. And so there's a a, a very strong case for virtual machines in a professional environment, um, but also in a, per, in a personal environment as well. And so in my personal environment, I use uh, Linux. Linux is what I am interested in in my personal uh, technology endeavors, not in my professional technology endeavors. I say that to also say that um, in this discussion, I do not endorse, I do not endorse Microsoft Windows or Apple or any processor brand. So I don't think that in the bigger picture, right, that Intel is better than AMD or that AMD is better than Intel or that the Apple M series chips, as impressive as they are, that they are better than Intel and AMD. I don't make that declaration. I used to, I, I once had very strong views about which brand of this or that was the best, but I moved beyond, moved beyond that. The more that I've learned, the more that I know, um, the more that I see more similarities than differences and that the distinctions tend not to be large enough to weigh too heavily in favor of one brand or another. And the best way to make a decision on information technology goes back to computer science 101, at least in the software development world, what are your requirements? And so my personal requirements leads me to Linux for my personal life. But in a business setting, the requirements may lead towards Microsoft Windows. Or, let's say, among sales professionals, you know, your top tier salespeople, their requirements for their equipment may lead them towards Apple. And so, that's simply, that's a sidebar. What I wanted to know, again, was uh, some of these software tools, like Microsoft Visual Studio, does it run well on an Intel Pentium. Now, on paper, from a computer science standpoint, the higher end hardware trumps the lower end hardware. It really does. And there are real world cases where, you know, the higher end hardware is completely recommended and completely appropriate. Try doing multi-threading in a software application. You're going to need 
um, multi-threading and you're going to need um, a boost in those threads and you're going to see it uh, more in a more pronounced way on a higher end hardware but that's not what we're looking at today what we're looking at is that in reality you can get lower end hardware now I'm talking about laptops and desktops that are capable of running Windows or Linux you're able to get that hardware to perform well on a fairly equivalent basis whether you're talking about an Intel Celeron, an Intel Pentium, an Intel Core i5, or an Intel Core i7. And I could just as easily say AMD Athlon, AMD Ryzen 3, AMD Ryzen 5, and AMD Ryzen 7, right? Because the capacity of the hardware is not the full story. It isn't. You can have really great hard hardware and poorly written software, and the software is so poorly written that it uses a lot more memory, a lot more processor, and because of that, software may look absolutely fabulous on the outside, great user interface, and it is dog slow. And at that point, you can't blame the hardware. The software is not optimized. But the thing is, operating systems, in this case Windows, it has a lot of different levers. You got the registry, you got the control panel, right? You got system properties, you got different areas of Microsoft Windows. And I'm not going to go into all of that. There are numerous YouTube videos that covers optimizations in Microsoft Windows right and I have pointed people towards those I don't make use of those myself I've been in the industry long enough where I you might say I grew up with Microsoft Windows and so I know a lot of the optimizations there and I have read books this 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 thick um, Windows uh, system internals right books by Rasanovich you know his name his last name is Rasanovich uh, and books by people like that that describe all the different layers of windows from the very bottom all the way up to the very top and so and then from a programming standpoint the books that show you the different programming layers of windows right so whereas some people they program at this layer up here where you can get things done very quickly um, I also uh, program at that layer too uh, when necessity demands it in a business environment but I found it's helpful to have knowledge of the bottom most layers where the action really happens and to be able to tap into those when required and so knowing your different layers helps you to build better systems but it also gives you insight into um, what in the system could be affecting performance so uh, i'm going to give a few tips here things like eye candy when you have menus where you click on the start menu and it just it pops up right well you might have this nice slick animation for the start menu to pop up when you click on a icon and um, you see the window just spread out a little bit you know well you can change the settings so that when you click on that icon you go click and it go pop just like that without going like this it just goes pop it just shows up right and so you eliminate all these micro delays in how the software is presented and that can improve performance a bit you can change your uh, page file swap file I know that can be controversial in some technical circles but it can have a pronounced impact on the performance of the system because I know Windows has a feature where it can automatically manage your swap file and that's you know all good and everything but keep in mind that automatic features sometimes gets it wrong you know one size doesn't fit all and so for your particular use of the computer getting those optimizations in can help you um, there are optimizations that have to do with um, how much memory is used by foreground versus background applications there are um, settings you can do to your applications well let's let's distinguish that 
they now there's now a terminology called apps and then there's the terminology called applications they're really the same exact thing they're just approached and presented in a different way but behind the scenes they have the same fundamentals and so in Windows 10 they had a feature called background apps and these are the apps that you can get delivered through the Microsoft Store well one of the things that was observed by keen te technical technological people was that um, too many background apps can bog down the computer so I don't go in there and, and uh, intricately slice and dice all of this I use shortcuts too to help optimize computer there's tweak software out there that can tweak your computer and um, help you um, through a visual mechanism identify those areas where uh, you can click a click a checkbox and click a button and it will apply those optimization settings whereas previously in the past we would have to go into a, a database called a registry you really don't want to do that because you can damage your computer that way using these tools is a safer way to do that um, and then one of my favorites is O and O software they're out of, they're out of Germany uh, they have made some free uh, tools uh, one's called App Buster and another one's called uh, Shut Up and these tools combined can uh, help you apply settings that optimize make Windows run faster we're talking about faster boot up not the literal boot up but the part where it switches uh, to the the actual Windows initialization and that uh, shows you the, the actual uh, start screen where you can log in right Th there's a lot of logic that happens between the time you press that power button and you see that black screen and then you see um, the, the the HP Dell or Lenovo logo and then you see the Microsoft uh, Windows uh, startup you look, in this case it's gonna be the little dial the little rotating circle whereas in uh, previous versions of Windows like Vista and 7 it was an actual Windows flag that like animated and then you go from there to the actual uh, login screen where you can press control alt delete press the down arrow and a button or press escape or something like that and from there to there there could be a time delay based on the the way it's 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 initializing itself and some of these tweaks you can make can cut that time down a little bit right it doesn't make it like this zero but you can go from here to here which which helps things a bit and then once you're on this login screen do you know that when you try to first log in like in Windows 10 and 11 what they added was uh, a way for the desktop to look like it's starting up quicker but it only looks that way what I've noticed ever since Windows Vista and I've been using Windows since Windows 3.1 right uh, what I've noticed since Windows Vista is that there's about a two minute time between the time that this login screen shows up and the desktop is actually ready so as soon as you see this and you try to log in depending on how Windows is initializing there could be a two-minute gap here between the time and you might see the desktop the desktops there but not all the icons are there on the on the task task tray right um, and then when you try to click on the start menu there might be more of a delay than you would see after you've been in Windows for a minute right and so I noticed that if you just wait two minutes uh, when you see that login screen it's gonna run just fine right so the big point there is that you can optimize Windows and so that even on a computer running with a Pentium processor you're gonna see a rise in performance it's gonna the performance is gonna go up like for example one time I helped somebody out they had a computer they, they they spent 200 i think they spent 250 dollars on it and they had an intel uh, celeron processor on it all right okay and i think it was a uh i think it was an 11 inch computer yeah i'm pretty sure it was an 11 inch computer it was, it was one of those small computers it was thin it was lightweight um but it cost like 250 dollars and it had a it had a celeron processor I think this was back in 2017 it might have been in 2017 when I did this so I took the computer and I just I optimized the Windows environment and after I did that that computer went from logging into the main screen 
uh, taking like five minutes to do that or, or whatever. And it was like, you know, you, you press the power button and that boot up took a little while, you know, but once it got to that initialization part for the actual windows, uh, that you, you got that login screen right away. And then once you did control out delete and you typed in your username, password, your username is preloaded, you typed in the password, as soon as you press that enter key or you click that, that, that arrow button, it was on a desktop and it was instantly loaded. And it felt like to that, that person, it felt like that computer ran as well as a $1,000 computer. A $250 computer runs as well as a $1,000 computer. And I have done that numerous times for people. I don't charge them money for it. I don't do any of that kind of thing. I just, you know, people that I, um, that, that I know and that I, that I work with, um, they decided to invest in a lower end computer. And I said, well, let's see what I can do. Let, let's optimize it. Now, the catch is, is that through Windows updates and that sort of thing, those optimizations, they may not hold up over time. And you have to readdress that like once every six months or, you know, once a couple, of you know, a few times a year, uh, maybe two or three times in a year. But um, the, the point is, is that once you optimize it, things like Microsoft Word, uh, Microsoft Edge, Firefox, um, even video editing, they're going to load, the programs are going to load up and you're going to be able to use them with a level of uh, efficiency that when we're talking about the performance that you can observe, we're not raw performance. We're not talking about trying to run Facebook or Google, you know, level websites on this computer. What we're talking about, when you click on an icon, the program comes up and you see it. And it's just right there. And it's, you're not waiting, um, you know, a minute or five minutes before you even see that program, right? And so, you know, I, I applied a theory that if you affect the software, you affect the, the experience of the computer. And that insight came from my work in professional software development where if you optimize the algorithms and data structures, you pay attention to locality of reference, you pay attention to cache hierarchies, you can make the software run well where, let's say, the company um, invested in some good hardware 10 years ago, but they haven't replaced that, that, that hardware uh, since then and you're still expected to deliver software that's going to work very well when there's no budget for new and um, up-to-date hardware. I'm not saying that was the case in every company that I worked with, um, but there were a few companies that were, you know, they, they had um, a slower um, rate of change in their um, their, their hardware upgrades. In some companies, they're on a two, two year, five year cycle, but there, there are some companies, you know, they're just in a place in terms of their business or in terms of where they are, where they can't uh, afford that. And so um, you find ways to squeeze performance when the situation requires it. And you, you reach into um, every resource you can. Um, in my case, I reach into resources like Dr. Donald Knuth and you know what he had to say about optimizing his um, his, his um, theoretical as, uh, assembly code, right? Um, and just you know doing the research necessary to understand um, how software can be better optimized. So what I'm going to show you um, here um, is that that was my introduction, and I, I'd apologize for the length of that introduction. And I'm going to show you the actual upgrade from Windows 10 to Windows 11 on an 11-inch HP computer, two-in-one computer that has an Intel Pentium processor. It's an Intel Pentium N5000 Silver Edition. It's a quad core, right? And that's important here, right? It's not your Pentium from the um, late 1990s, early 2000s. It's not the same Pentium. I call it a Intel 
i5, i3, or i7 um, miniature, right? It's like a junior version of that, right? Because it has many of the same facilities, but in a more constrained way, but in a way that still works once you have software that's optimized to run on it, right? You also have to keep in mind that uh, Microsoft Word has been around for a good, good while. You know, I was using Microsoft Word, um, you know, uh, way back when, you know, Word, I think it was Word uh, 5.1 that I was using. Anyway, but the thing is, is that Microsoft Office has parts of it that's been optimized for much older processors, you know, than we have today. And those optimizations are still there, right? So it wouldn't be a surprise that if you can optimize the environment in which these programs run, that at least in Microsoft Windows, you're going to see an improvement in performance. And so um, I talk about Linux in another video. And to me, that is my favorite video of all time. Um, and so if you're interested in Linux and want to learn more about it, I would refer you to that Linux um, of you know, Linux every day, Fedora every day uh, by Michael Gaucher, right? And so what I'm gonna show you um, in the upcoming uh, uh, minutes is that upgrade from 10 to 11 using Windows 10. And then when I did the upgrade from 10 to 11, um, I not only um, did the upgrade using Windows Update, but after I did the update, I did a factory reset. And what that did was it cleared away a large part of the residual Windows 10 configuration, right? Because when you do the upgrade from 10 to 11, you're going to get residual information from the previous Windows 10 setup. And so I know it took me three hours to do the upgrade, and I'm not gonna show you all three hours, I'm just gonna show you quick snippets. But when I went after that, it, I did the factory reset, that was another hour and a half. Um, I know it took a while, but it was important to, that I had a quality software environment, you know, so that the optimizations were true and faithful optimizations. I didn't fully optimize this, this install after I did the upgrade and after I reset the environment. I didn't fully optimize it. I did the bare minimum optimizations I could do within, I would say, five minutes. And so, and I still reaped a good reward out, out of that. And so I will talk more about that process um, as I go through um, the the uh, the actual upgrade and where I show you um, Microsoft Visual Studio running on a computer with four gigabytes of RAM Intel Pentium processor and keep in mind I did upgrade the hard drive in this computer um, from a 500 gigabyte mechanical hard drive made by Seagate uh, to a 500 gigabyte SSD made by Samsung. And that did have an impact on the performance in 2019. And I still see performance benefits from that and I hear in 2022. So stay tuned. This is the laptop that I was referring to earlier. The 11 inch HP 2-in-1. And as you can see, I've applied a custom paint job to it and I did the same to the Apple Pencil. And so it's all in one piece minus some upgrades. This is the specifications through system information. And this is the Windows Update screen that um, shows the progress on the upgrade to Windows 11. So now that I've upgraded it to Windows 11, I'm going to turn right back around and do a factory reset, like I said earlier, to clear out the extraneous Windows 10 configuration. I lost my Windows, I'm sorry, my Microsoft Office install, and so I'm reinstalling Microsoft Office. And once I have Microsoft Office installed, the next thing that I'm going to do is optimize the Windows install. And that's not shown here, but I used App Buster and Shut Up, like I showed earlier, like I stated earlier. And then I go to Microsoft's website and I download Visual Studio. And I proceeded to install Visual Studio. The install 
took, I believe it took about 30 minutes to an hour. I had a download hiccup, but that was easily resolved. I had uh, set my installation setting to download first and then install rather than install while done. And so although the progress bar here shows that it's downloading and then installing, it's simply pulling from the local file cache, which speeds up the install if it has to re resume um, after an error. So it's near completion. We're near the end of the Visual Studio install. So far, so good. Um, I'm quite pleased with the progress that has been made so far. And I'm looking forward to the point where we can actually launch Visual Studio. Uh, right now, the installer is doing a cleanup. It's getting rid of all of the extraneous installation files that it generated in order to uh, put the final build of Visual Studio to the system. And so I see that it is at the last part of the cleanup process. And we are almost there. Oh, there's the screen that we were looking for. And this is the, um, the final screen. I'm going to go ahead and close the screen out and launch Visual Studio through the Start menu. As you can see, I've made a modification to the desktop theme and image so that it's a little more polished, a little, little cleaner. And so I'm going to go to All Apps and scroll down to Visual Studio 2022 and then uh, launch that program. One of the things you'll notice is that the, uh, the splash screen is, um, has come a long way since the early days of Visual Studio.net in the year 2000, 2002. It does take a few minutes for the Visual Studio launch screen to load. And with uh, Visual Studio these days, you have to log in with a Microsoft account or your Outlook.com account. I'm going to log in with a Outlook.com account. I don't show that here. I mean, did you expect me to show the world my email address? So I've edited out my email address you know, for safety reasons. Uh, now that I have applied my credentials, it's now applying any known settings. Um, from the last time I launched Visual Studio under that account, which in this case was probably four or five years ago. So it's been several years since I have launched Visual Studio on my personal computers. And here's the project screen, the initial project screen for Visual Studio. You'll notice here in a moment that it takes a while to pick up on the theme because uh, it defaults to the dark theme. I'm going to uh, continue into the main Visual Studio without using that, that launch screen. And I'm going to create a project, the, the more, you might call it the old-fashioned way or a more contemporary way. Um, and so I'm going to go into the file menu and I'm going to... Um, Creative project from there. I'm just poking around here to see if there's anything that uh, I need to make note of. Um, I was quite satisfied many years ago when they finally integrated uh, Git into uh, Visual Studio uh, following their uh, purchase and acquisition of GitHub. So here we are em embarking on a process to create a new project, a Visual Studio project. I'm going to create a console project. Um, and again, the exercise here is simply to see how Visual Studio responds when running on a computer with just a Pentium processor and four gigabytes of memory. My theory, if you picked up on that earlier in the introduction is that 
it's going to run just fine. And the reason why I was so confident is that I've done numerous, numerous command line uh, processes on Windows and Linux, especially Linux, under constrained uh, hardware uh, uh, parameters, and it works just fine, you know. So, although we have a GUI involved here, uh, and I'm going to name my solution after all these years, you know, a symbolic nod to myself that, oh, after all these years, uh, you, you finally have gotten back into Visual Studio, albeit uh, briefly. But, yeah, so when you're building these software applications, um, it's particularly in a Linux environment, it's um, customary to have um, tools like SSH, you know, Open SSH, uh, Secure Shell, where you're logging into another server through the command line, and you could also be logging into that server where it's an actual live server, or it could be on a virtual machine, right? And so the objective there is to be able to execute commands on that other server because you don't either have the time or the infrastructure in place to run a GUI on a server. I mean, who really wants to do that? And so proficiency with the command line is useful. Notice I clicked create and it's actually putting together the solution visually. You know, it's putting the, the, the icons in, in place for the solution in the background, if, if you notice that. Um, I noticed it was building different parts of that. And so there it is. Uh, we have the solution in the project. It didn't take very long to establish that. And we got our class template here uh, with a static void main, our entry point into the class. And so um, what I want to do is put some De demonstration code in here just to give this installation of Visual Studio uh, a, a shakedown. Like, let's, let's give it a test. So I built a, I'm building a console application. I chose a console application because it's dead simple uh, to test out Visual Studio that way. I could have went with a GUI application because as you know, Visual Studio is among the um, chief tools for creating graphical user interface applications um, but I have less to worry about less to click when I choose a console application I could make it just one line of code we could just say console dot right line and then in parentheses and double quotes uh, hello world right and then click start at the top but I want to add a little bit more uh, to that um, and I'm trying to write this from memory. I'm not looking up the code from the internet or anything like this. And so I was pretty sure the console, uh, the static console class was in the uh, IO uh, namespace under system, under the system namespace. But that turned out to be incorrect. So using type inference in Visual Studio, I'm going to delete the system.io part. Uh, but first, I'm going to see if there's a, maybe a, a reference that I'm missing. And of course, there's not a reference that I'm missing here, but um, sometimes it's helpful to look. And then I'm going to um, write out the code, and we're going to delete the, uh, the system.io prefix and um, the console class is going to resolve to the system namespace that's already been declared on line one in this class. So instead of hello world, I'm going to put what's up, you know, let's do something different. I know uh, hello world is a staple in computer programming, but for the last uh, 50 or 60 years or so, but let's, let's change it up and let's go with what's up. And I'm off to a little bit of a slow start here, but after I uh, get this, uh, straight now we're gonna speed things up a little bit so like us I, I, I did mention this earlier but I have been writing .NET code since around October of 2000 
And so I have way beyond 10,000 hours experience with it. So even though I took a couple of years break from writing .NET code, um, now that I wrote that first line of code, it's now all just starting to flow out of me uh, from memory, um, which is quite, pretty awesome. You know, for as long as .NET remains relevant, and since .NET is the chief platform for Microsoft, and since everybody loves Microsoft, then you know I will always have a place in the world of Microsoft. Um, and so I'm going to uh, do a dynamic variable um, called data values. I'm going to type it to an array. And I'm going to preload this array with um, a set of strings. And then I'm going to iterate that array using a, a, um, a for loop. And I'm going to output the contents of this array to the console. And that's pretty much the sketch of the program that I've uh, put together. And so pretty trivial stuff for me. Um, I like um, setting up arrays in this way in .NET. I know there are a number of ways to do that, and this is by far my favorite. Um, my second favorite uh, would have to be using the um, dot add, using the um, the add method. That is uh, typed to to the corresponding collection class or interface, and um, uh, I I tend to use that particularly when iterating over uh, data sets um, from a let's say a tabular data stream from a SQL Server, and then inducting the contents of that stream into intermediate collection uh, for further manipulation and use. So that's pretty much the program there. And then what I'm going to do is um, set up a, a, a pause, right? So I'm going to um, cause the thread, the, the um, main thread, to pause for about, um, let's say, one, one or two seconds. Uh, so that way um, I can uh, output to the console, press any key to, um, to continue, right? And then uh, after the key is pressed, I don't want to immediately terminate the application. I want it to hold there for just a second um, so that if there's any uh, additional output, I want to add in um, before the application exits then there's sufficient time for the operator of the program to um, read whatever messages are presented. So I'm setting up another dynamically typed variable, uh, return values, and I'm going to use the result of this variable to determine um, whether or not um, additional um, content is output. And I'm going to do that on the basis of the uh, the value of the string. Uh, if there's uh, data in the string, then that is a hint to the program to um, output uh, the values that are returned back. In a more sophisticated program, you would want to check that, in, that uh, input uh, for security issues. Um, for injection, uh, value injection uh, issues. But um, since I am going to be the only user of this program, and I do love to delete programs like this, you know, because it's like 
I don't keep around a collection of test programs. But uh, for the purposes of demonstration, uh, this suffices. So I love this feature of Visual Studio where it suggests um, using declaration. There was a tool um, available at one point uh, called ReSharper. I, I loved ReSharper, and I think the Visual Studio team, the team that uh, puts Visual Studio together, um, at one point they they, uh, they found inspiration from this ReSharper tool by JetBrains, and they uh, incorporated uh, uh, features terms of formatting code and um, automating uh, code writing uh, so that uh, you know, the, the default uh, setup of Visual Studio was as convenient as ReSharper. And here I'm looking at the uh, format document uh, uh, command for the menu but as you saw, you can press Control K and Control D. Um, I like to use keystrokes myself, um, but given that this is a new version of Visual Studio, I just thought I'd look in that uh, formatting menu to see if there was any other format commands that may be useful. And one of the great things about Visual Studio is that you can uh, go through the visual menus and see what the corresponding keystroke commands are, so you can automate um, your, your workflow or you can or you can use Visual Studio more productively um, using only the keyboard. And so uh, my intent here is to run the uh, program and um, I see the start um, the start button that used to uh, I believe that used to be called debug or run. But, uh, so here's the output of the console application. There's the, the output that we're looking for. And just press the enter key. That will cause the program to exit. In that uh, particular example, I typed OK and uh, the program repeated what I typed and then exited after the, uh, the delay time had elapsed. So that's Visual Studio. Uh, let's take a quick spin through the project properties, see what we uh, find there. Um, click on the assembly information, make a few edits there. Again, this is for demonstration purposes. If um, you're part of a team in, a, uh, in, a, in an organization that established standards for .NET programs, there would be um, there, there would be uh, standards you'd have to follow in terms of um, how this information is encoded into the software application. And in some cases, you can automate this so that uh, you know, once the program is uh, put through continuous integration, it, um, it is marked appropriately. But, you know, in those environments where you're, you're more or less solo, uh, you still want to be as complete as you can with that type of information. I'm going to unmark the uh, preferred 32-bit. I'm not a fan of that. Um, that's more for... Um, backwards compatibility. Um, and then uh, the settings, I, I really liked the, uh, the settings when they introduced that automation into Visual Studio, I, I was a huge fan of that. I just absolutely love settings. Um, and it's, it's definitely great when you're doing solo uh, software development through Visual Studio, but um, when you are in environments with more extensive requirements, you want to use a database-driven approach. So that's uh, Windows 11 on a Pentium processor.